This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. There are so many things happening nationally in the USA, EU, Asia, around the world, happening with increasing intensity, increasing frequency. And it's like somebody is turning the volume way up. And the question is, I think of Dr. Francis Schaeffer, who, whose theology and whose thinking mentored me at, at a crucial time when I was barely saved, when I was just like saved months after fleeing a denominational Christian religious retreat in the middle of nowhere in the <coughs> cornfields of Missouri. And when I went there looking for truth, I saw a confirmation of my worst suspicions about what Christianity was about. I saw a bunch of fraternity and sorority girls literally playing spin the bottle. For crying out loud, who plays spin the bottle? And I went there to talk about Jesus. I was there to ask questions about Jesus. Back then, I was a radical in the counterculture. I was majoring in altered states of consciousness as part of the field of psychology, and I was uh, majoring in filmmaking, a dual major. I had hair down to my waist, my belt buckle. Uh, I was demonstrating with Abby Hoffman when I was 15 years old, the radical activist. I was at the first Earth Day leaders planning session in Manhattan. Not that I was a leader by any means. I was 15 years old, but they allowed me in the meeting. I was made an honorary member. I was made an honorary member of the original Black Panther Party, not not the one now. Two different things. And the reason I was made an honorary member is when I joined up when I went to, to the Black Panther Party headquarters in New York City to join up. <clears throat> they wouldn't allow me to be a full fledged member of the Black Panther Party. And in my naivete and, and, and foolishness as a, a young kid, I challenged the guy, tough-looking guy in a black leather jacket, which was the, the hallmark of the Panthers back then. And I said, well, wh- why can't I be, uh, why won't you let me be or join the Black Panther Party as a full-time member? No, actually, he said, you cannot be, excuse me. He, he declined to allow me to be a Black Panther at all. He said, you can't be a member of the Black Panther Party. And being young and naive, I, I answered to him, and he was a tough-looking guy. And this was not a neighborhood that welcomed white people. Uh, I said to him, I said to him, the reason I want to join the Black Panther Party is because I, I identify with your struggle uh, for civil rights, solidarity, and I articulated uh, my were sincere reasons for wanting to join the Black Panther Party. I'd read the book by the, and see, today's Black Panther Party and many of today's African-American activists don't even know who these people are, which is ridiculous because I'm white. I was debating this girl, uh, a, a very liberal African-American female talk show, uh, radio talk show host, I was debating her on Fox News Network, and the sparks were flying. And when I told her the story that I'm telling you now, she scoffed and and mocked and laughed in the camera as if I was making it up. Well, that little attempt at winning the debate went down in flames and burned crash on her part real quick because I simply threw out some names of people that I knew. She had no idea who these people were. And it's like, what? I mean, you are an African-American activist, and you don't know who the head of the original Black, pa- uh, Black Panther Party was? You don't know who Elridge Cleaver was, who was head of the Department of Communications for the Black Panther Party? You don't know who Huey P. Newton is? I mean, these were icons in those days. But her knowledge of black civil rights activism was very shallow and it's rather a pathetic it's rather pathetic that a irish 
white boy from Jackson Heights, Queens, knew more about the Black Panthers than she did. So when she, when, when the host of the Fox News Network program uh, and the people engaged in the debate recognized that, hey, this guy's not making up. That's this guy, that's me. This white guy is not making up the story. He obviously knows his stuff backwards and forwards. He's telling a true story. She shut up. She shut up and lost the debate. Because I told the exact same story that I'm telling to you now, which is when I went to join the Black Panther Party and I went to the headquarters in New York City, they declined. They, they wouldn't allow me to join. I was, okay. So after expressing my reason, I tried to, to, to convince them to, to let me join anyway. So after giving my heartfelt, sincere reasons why I wanted to join the Black Panther Party as a white guy, after I was refused, I said, you know what? You, the reason you're refusing me, and I'll tell you what the, he, the reason he gave. He said, you're, you're not allowing me to be a, a, a member of the Black Panther Party, and I support your cause. Why? And he looked at me and he said, it's because you're white. So I said to him, not not the smartest thing to say to a, to a guy like him. I said to him, when he said, we can't let you in the Black Panther Party because you're white, I said to him, that's discrimination. And I was shocked that I said it, actually, because I, you just, if you knew where I was in the environment that I was in, you just don't say that. <laughs> you just don't say it. The place was filled with Black Panthers. You just don't say that. So, but I said it anyway. And so, to my surprise, he, he, he considered what I said. He paused for a moment, contemplated it, and it was like a pin could drop in the room because all these other heavy-duty Black Panther Party people were like waiting to see what he said because he was the, the leader. And he said, you know what? I'm going to make an exception in your case. I'm going to allow you to be an official part-time member of the Black Panther Party. And he did. So I was an official part-time member of the Black Panther Party because I was white. So he made, he made accommodations, which that was, that was fine. That was fine. You know? So the point that I'm making is that th those desires that I had were for real. See, I really did uh, uh, empathize with the struggle of African Americans um, and still do, by the way. I, I certainly don't agree with today's Black Panther Party, and I didn't agree with everything they did back then. But I believe that you ought to stand up and be counted in, in a peaceful, loving, spiritual way, by the way, law-abiding law way, that you stand up for what you believe in. And so here we are in America right now. I mean, how many people are willing to stand up in a law-abiding, peaceful way for what they believe in. And I'm specifically talking about Christians, evangelical Christians. If you want to know why America, uh, you know, just because one person becomes president, no man... If the Bible teaches us anything, no man, no president, nobody from either political party, whether, whether you're a Christian that's a, a liberal or a conservative, if you begin to look at a man, or if the day comes, a woman, just because they're president or whatever, but you start to look at that man or woman as if they were your source, capital S, as if they were your Messiah, your Savior, you're in big trouble. That's what the Christian people and the Catholic people did in Nazi Germany. They didn't look at Hitler as just a politician anymore. They started to look at Adolf Hitler as if he was the source, capital S, 
they started to look at Adolf Hitler as if he was the Messiah, as if he was the Savior, as if he was Jesus. And once you, once you go down that path, that's the beginning of the end. And you'll always be disappointed. Now, that doesn't mean you're not responsible to vote, to pray, and be involved. But you don't worship any man or any man-made system as God or the Messiah. The minute you do that, first of all, the minute you do that, you're violating one of God's Ten Commandments. The minute you do that, you're violating one of God's primary rules or laws. That law is reiterated in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, the blessings and the curses. And remember, the prosperity, which was undeserved for America, um, and the blessing and the freedoms that we have in America, all have to do with the fact that the pilgrims and Puritans entered into a covenant with God in the 1600s based on the covenant that God made with the Jews and the physical descendants of Abraham. And that covenant, or that spiritual principle, rather, is in Deuteronomy 28, among numerous other passages of the Bible. And let me read you what it says. You hear me read this continually, but because it's, it's so powerful. And unless we understand what God is really saying in Deuteronomy 28, um, we cannot be the people that God created us to be. Our prophetic destiny as individuals and as a nation is, it can't come to pass without understanding the, this in Deuteronomy 28 and living it. So I'm going to read you Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations in the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So actually, I just read to you Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 5. And I'm going to read just a little bit more. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. And then there's a whole long list of political, geopolitical, economic, health blessings and blessings of all kinds God promises to pour out on his people if they will obey these two primary principles. Number one, if you faithfully, and and by the way, I want to direct this not only to us as Christians, or to us as Americans, or to us as uh, the French, or to us as South Americans or Asians, or whatever nation you live in. Um, However, though, the pilgrims and Puritans entered into a covenant with God based on Deuteronomy 28. But I want to talk to you personally and individually right now. If you look at your life, and you do not think you are being properly blessed, if you think you're being cursed, or if you look at your nation, your community, and your state, and you don't see what you perceive to be blessing, but you see perceived to like a curse, ask yourself the following questions. Because there's conditions, according to God, for the blessings of Deuteronomy 28. It says, if you faithfully Obey the voice of the Lord your God. So number one question you need to ask yourself, I need to ask myself, we need to ask ourselves, is this. Are we faithfully obeying the voice of the Lord your God? Which, which means, are we faithfully obeying what God has told us to do in his word? The voice of the Lord thy God is the same thing as the word of God. Are we 
not just obeying it, are we faithfully obeying it? So examine yourself. And if you're not happy with your life, examine yourself and say, am I faithfully obeying the word of God, the voice of the Lord God? And the same with a nation, the same with an individual. Ask yourself the question and don't con yourself because the law of reciprocity, the law of sowing and reaping, God sees right through our attempts at blowing smoke in his eyes. It doesn't work. You say, well, where, where is blowing smoke in your eyes in the Bible? All I did was paraphrase what Adam and Eve did. They attempted to blow smoke in the eyes of God after they disobeyed God's word and ate from the fruit of the middle of the tree in the Garden of Eden. They disobeyed God's word, and instead of admitting it and repenting about it to the Lord, they hid their nakedness by covering their private parts with um, <clears throat> fig leaves. Well, that's really the same thing as attempting to blow smoke in somebody's eyes, because their intent was to hide from God the fact that they had disobeyed his word and uh, that they were naked. So blowing smoke in somebody's eyes is a, is a method of trying to enable them not to see so that, so that you can hide what you're trying to do. Okay, so that's the first thing they did wrong. And then it says, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, not just some, that I command you today. So if you do this, if you obey all his commandments and you faithfully obey uh, the voice of the Lord your God, this is the promise that happens to you or to a nation. The Lord says, um, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So, so if you obey the voice of the Lord your God, which is the word of God, all these blessings shall overtake you. And then there's a long list of blessings in every area of life. These are not just spiritual blessings. These are blessings in every area of life. So, look at your life and then ask yourself the question, am I really diligently obeying the voice of the Lord God? Am I, am I reading the Word of God? And am I endeavoring to, to obey all His commandments, not just cherry-pick them? Let me give you an example, and I, and I really don't want, I'm, I'm not trying to just pick on people who are committing this sin. But this is what just came to my mind. There is a massive percentage of Christian men and women of varying ages, primarily in the younger age categories, but also in the adult age categories. There's a massive number of Christians who have bought into the cultural tradition of our present society and our present world system. And instead of um, having intimate relations and sleeping together within the holy covenant of marriage, as God has commanded, they are sleeping together or living together outside of marriage because they're borrowing the world system, the world's way of doing things. I'm not trying to pick on people, and I understand the reasons that they have. And some of the reasons sound relatively good. So here's one reason that sounds relatively good. They see divorce everywhere. They see people who are unhappily married everywhere. So they're not in a rush to, to get married and make the same mistake. Now, that doesn't justify the sin, but it does, it explains the rationale, okay? <clears throat> However, here's the problem. Every time you have passionate feelings towards someone, I'm assuming you're not married, 
and you, you, you want to express those passionate feelings. So you, 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 in a real hurry, get married so you can not violate God's word. That, that's a big mistake. No, no, no. You need to wait. I don't care how, how, I don't care how bright and intense the fires of passion and romance and heat are burning. You check out and you seek the Lord and you use wisdom before you tie the knot. <clears throat> but I'm saying is, you see, by, by disobeying God in this fundamental area, God, it's not that God's being cruel. He's trying to spare you misery. So if you just ignore God's commandment, which is not to engage in physical intimacy until you're married, not to live together until after you're married, you are breaking the commandments and the voice of the Lord God. And if you do that and you do all kinds of other breaking of the commandments of the Lord your God, you're, you're, you're setting in motion a spiritual principle where you're depriving yourself the opportunity of being blessed beyond your wildest dreams. Because God says, and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, um, being careful to do all his commandments. So you see, you can go to church, you can read the Bible, you can join this study group, that study group. But if, if you get right down to it and you're living together outside of marriage, you're sleeping together outside of marriage, you're not obeying all his commandments. And, and what does God's word says will happen? It's not that God is like hyper-focused on just sexual sin. That's one sin among all kinds of potential sins. And um, God says that if you're careful to obey all his commandments that he commands you, then the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And then all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. It's one thing to be blessed. It's, it's, it's another thing to have blessings come down so intensely that they overtake you. Um, and then it says you're going to be blessed. There's a little summary of blessings. You shall be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Uh, that would be your area of work. Not everybody lives in an agricultural society. Blessed um, shall be you. Blessed shall you be in the field, or your business, or your job, or your career. Blessed shall you. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb. That means that God promises you that if you will diligently obey Him and His commandments, that God will supernaturally bless your child bearing, and he'll bless your babies in the womb. That's exactly what it says. Uh, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your ca cattle. So obviously we're not all farmers and stuff. So the fruit, the fruit of our occupation. So we're not all raising cattle, and we're not all, uh, you know, taking care of herds, and we're not, you know, all farmers. So, so this is God's promise of blessing upon your occupation. If you're a salesperson, God is saying you will close uh, an unusually high percentage of sales and great sales. You could, you could translate this to, to, to the results and rewards of any occupation. Uber driver, you'll get a lot of good rides. Uh, people will tip generously, and they will be long and productive rides. You could translate this to any area of life. And then, and then it says, blessed shall be your basket. Well, we don't all use baskets and kneading bowls. We're not all making bread. So basket could be your investment portfolio, whether you're investing in this or buying gold or real estate or whatever. Your investments will be prospered, okay? And then it says, blessed shall you be when you come in. So every day when you come home, you'll come home to blessing. And every day when you go out, 
You'll go out to blessing, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Now, I want to I want to say something important here. The 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 one verse, by the way, that's the most mind blowing is God says, "I will set you high above all the nations of the earth." The reason the United States of America has been set up high above all the nations of the earth in comparison to every nation in human history, America, yes, American exceptionalism true is true. It has been blessed above all the nations of the earth. It's been blessed higher than all the nations of the earth. Not because we're better, good. We, we, we know the record of sins that America has in its history. I've been through that countless times. I don't need to repeat it at the moment. America doesn't have 100% pure past. We know, pure past, we know that. <clears throat> so you, you will be blessed, though. America. The reason for America's blessing ultimately has to do with the fact that, however imperfectly, it, its people attempted to adhere to God's voice and commandments. Did they do it perfectly? No, we all know that. So a tremendous blessing was poured out, and the same thing occurs in your own life. Now, here is an important uh, uh, explanation. This passage of Scripture is certainly not saying, see, this is why you don't cherry-pick a passage of Scripture or a couple of verses. You don't cherry-pick it and take it out of context. You have to balance those verses with other verses throughout the Bible. And this does not in any way, shape, or form imply that just because you do all these things, that you will be immune from trials, tribulations, adversities, nor does it promise you will not have struggles and challenges, and just in every single area where I just read, you'd be blessed. You say that's a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. God promised blessing if you do such and such. But he did not promise you a perfect world where everything is going to go perfectly. So, for example, it says, blessed shall you be when you go out. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Well, you may have stress at your job. This doesn't say you won't have stress. You may have stress the minute you walk in the door at home. Your wife may be sick. Your husband may be sick. Your kids may be screaming. You may have unpaid bills lying on the on, in the kitchen or living room, and 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 you're you're going to be saying, well, gee, I should be blessed when I come in, and, and everybody's screaming, and the kids are screaming, and there's bills, and there's so much tension in the air, you can cut it with a knife, and then then you whine to the Lord and say, Lord, you promised to bless me when I come in and when I go out, and and it doesn't appear like that's happening. Well, that's important for you to to maturely and rightly divide the word of God. Because God says, yes, he will do this for you. But God also says that we will have trials and tribulations. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. So let's not misinterpret this. This, what I read you, is not God coming down and sprinkling the magic pixie dust over your household and your life and you know, everything you touch turns to gold and you never have a problem and blah, 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 blah. God is not saying that. In this world, you're going to have adversities, tribulations, trials, temptations. You're going to be engaged in blood curdling, that's a metaphor, spiritual warfare. And you're going to have to engage in spiritual battles and prayer and fasting in order to possess all these promises. Uh, a great man of God once said to me, the promises of God are not automatically ours. So I just read you a whole bunch of promises. The promises of God are not automatically ours. Just because God promises all this, it doesn't automatically mean you get them. You have to possess the land. That means conquering the giants in the land through faith in the promises of God. So God isn't, is, isn't saying your life is going to be magical and problem-free. So don't walk away, because that's what faith teaching taught. And faith teaching is a heretical era, because it, it promised a lie. It, 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 it took Bible verses and bent them out of shape. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving you prosperity teaching. Okay? 
you will have trials and tribulations and difficulties. The key thing is here is that the Lord is your source. That's the thing you got to remember. The Lord is your source. The Lord is your source. So, for example, there's more promises of blessing down in verse 11. And the Lord um, will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your livestock, and the fruit of your ground, within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. So, obviously, we're, again, we're not all farmers, so abounding in prosperity may refer to not livestock, and may refer, whatever your business you're in. May, maybe you have a restaurant that would refer, refer to that. Maybe you have a, a, a house cleaning service. It would refer to that. But the key here is that God is our source. God is God. We're not looking to other things like government or political leaders or gurus or whatever to be our God. Because then those things become idols. What we worship, what we look to to be our source, if it's not the true God, then you're worshiping idols. And if you are worshiping idols, whether you realize it or not, an idol can be the company you work for. If you think mistakenly that the company you work for is your source for everything, what inevitably will happen at some point in your career, and you may have a magic carpet ride for 40 years, They'll downsize, you'll be terminated. Maybe not. Maybe you'll just walk away with a good retirement. That does happen. But but you you are very naive if you're looking at your company as your source to be your God. In the same way, this is why Marxism, socialism, and communism is so spiritually dangerous, because it it its uh, ideology causes people to look to government or any kind of man-made system or a man-made leader to be their source, capital S, in essence, to be their God. And so, without realizing it, whatever you look to to meet all your needs becomes your God, becomes your idol. And if, if that could be anything, again, the company you work, or you work for or whatever, what happens is that you will discover that if, you, if that's what you're doing, you're worshiping idols, and by, by, by doing that, you're placing yourself under a spiritual curse. You cannot violate the precepts and commandments and the Word of God without reaping or sowing a curse and reaping a curse. That's the elemental lesson that God gave to Adam and Eve in the garden. He gave them paradise in the Garden of Eden, perfect age, everything. They lived under total blessing. But they said, there, God said, there's one thing you can't do. You can't eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, because in the day that you do, you shall surely die. And so... Adam and Eve had everything. They lived in paradise. But they decided to listen to the serpent who was indwelt by Satan, who lied to them, and they ate. They disobeyed God. They violated God's commandment and God's word. And they ate from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. And that caused a massive curse. They activated the law of sin and death. And that caused all mankind, and it caused themselves to live under a curse. They lost paradise in a second. And what caused them to, 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 to lose paradise in, in a second? They violated the principle in Deuteronomy 28, even though Deuteronomy 28 hadn't come around yet. They violated the principle of faithfully obeying the voice of the Lord your God and being careful to do all his commandments. They only had one commandment to obey. But you see, when you disobey God's commandment, you activate a curse, and all hell broke loose. So here in the United States today, we have vast multitudes of people who have chosen to become humanists. They believe that they, in their human strength, 
and human systems are God. That's an idol. They've put themselves under a curse. There are people who think government is going to take care of all their needs. They've put themselves under a curse. Any system, any individual, some charismatic leader that they follow becomes an idol. They put themselves under a curse. So you got to ask yourself, are you doing that? Now, in the short term, many times it will appear as if following an idol, whatever form that idol may take, it may, in the short term, appear to be, wow, I've arrived in the promised land. Everything's going great. But, but don't be naive or fooled. You got to look at the big picture. You got to look at the end end result. You got to look at the long term. God's word stands true. So yeah, you may have some seductive years of plenty and what appears to be blessing, but then the curse that you activated by worshiping an idol will be realized. Again, I watched this documentary just the other day on Tenement Square, where in 1989. After the brutal communist revolution led by Chairman Mao, who promised a worker's paradise, who promised social justice, who promised there wouldn't be any rich, all the money would be divided equally, who promised high paying, great jobs for everyone, who promised everybody would have food and everybody would have equal medical care. Big, big promises from the communists, as always. And so, What happened was, as people joined the communist movement, over a million people were slaughtered in the communist revolution. They lost all of their freedoms. None of the promises, uh, none of the promises came true. It was all a lie. Over a million people were starved to death. They lost every right and freedom they had. They were demoralized. They lived like robots in a total dictatorial, totalitarian dictatorship. No freedom whatsoever. So in 1989, the, the students of the communist Chinese began to rebel. They wanted freedoms like Americans. You notice there's never any rebellions in America uh, where people want to change America to be more like Cuba or Russia or China, the communist nations. That never happens. So they wanted to be have freedoms like the USA. They wanted a bill of rights like the USA. They wanted to be free. They were tired of living, living like slaves. So Tenement Square, which is this giant open square surrounded by government buildings and a, picture, a gigantic mural of Chairman Mao, the communist dictator, and they began to protest for the first time. They dared to openly protest the communist Chinese government. And they kept protesting, and this went on for months, and they kept being more intense and more intense. And finally, after repeated warnings from the communist Chinese government, these guys are dictators, man, dictators. The communist Chinese government warned them and warned them and warned them to stop protesting. And they thought, well, because public opinion was on their side, that they would be okay. And and the communist Chinese dictators did what nobody in the entire world ever expected them to do. And they did it openly in the public, in front of television cameras, film cameras, so that the whole world could see what happened. They ordered uh, communist Chinese heavily armed troops and tanks. And these young soldiers that were male and female were the same age as the communist Chinese college students who were demonstrating. And by the way, it was a peaceful demonstration. But the communist Chinese dictators dictators ordered the tanks to come in, the soldiers to come in with heavily armed guns, machine guns. And they massacred with bullets and tanks and machine guns. Uh, they slaughtered um, at least, we, we don't know what the real number is, because at one point there were like 100,000 people or more in Tenement Square. But among the people who stayed, even after the bullets kept flying, they slaughtered somewhere between seven and 8,000 people in cold blood, being riddled with bullets like something out of a movie. Uh, over almost 8,000 
common, young, innocent communist Chinese students were, were shot to death, run over with tanks, blown to bits with tanks. It was gory, bloody, and hideous. They were massacred in Tiananmen Square. And to this day, the communist Chinese people in China are not even allowed to mention that it ever happened. Now, nobody really knows because of the uh, censorship, uh, the whole story, but whether how many people were forced into the communist dictatorship or how many people made the choice to, to worship the idol of communist Chinese government meeting all their needs. A lot of times it only begins, all it takes, by the way, historically is for, for like 10% of the population, 7% of the population, to be seduced into believing, let's say, in the lies of communism. And that 7 or 10% can take control of our entire nation. And then the bloodshed that I describe is commonplace in communist nations. They're not worshiping the Lord their God. For, for like a hundred years before the communist Chinese revolution, God must have anticipated this because there were huge numbers of missionaries going back decades before the communist Chinese revolution. Massive numbers of Christian missionaries coming especially from the United States of America, but other nations missionaries, Christian born-again missionaries were pouring into China for like, I think for like a hundred years, while there was a the, the period of time where the door was open, and they were winning millions of people to Jesus Christ and discipling huge numbers of people to Jesus Christ. So there was a huge percentage of the Chinese people who were born again and reading their Bibles. So even though the communist Chinese revolution occurred, and millions were slaughtered, the Chinese, true Chinese church went underground, and to this day they meet in secret underground churches and revival all the evil and the horror the Chinese the communist government literally causing people to live, raising them in prisons so they can use them to grow body parts like livers and eyeballs and hearts and stuff. Make no mistake about it, none whatsoever. The infinite personal living God of the universe, his eyes see everything. Nothing is hidden or concealed from the God who exists. And when men and women participate, either through action or by empowering directly or indirectly, such horrific acts, against our fellow man, fellow woman, or children. Um, we don't live in the humanistic universe described by secular humanists and those that subscribe to the communist, socialist, Marxist theory where they don't believe in a God. They indoctrinate people. To deliberately not believe in God, to not believe in an uh, absolute right and an absolute wrong or a wrong or a right. They indoctrinate people to believe that, that marriage does not matter. It's irrelevant. Whatever feels good, do it. They indoctrinate people to believe that there's no reason to. to be patriotic to a nation that attempts to do righteousness and good, even if it's imperfect. And they believe in the total, this, for crying out loud, they believe in the total decimation and destruction of not only Christianity, Judaism, the Bible. They believe in the total destruction and annihilation from the hearts and minds of people of any concept of the truth of God's existence. They are at war with God. And so is any other man, woman, or group which devotes its energy, its monetary power, its, its rhetoric or, or faulty logic or whatever to when people concentrate their energies and their God-given gifts 
to erase the very notion of God out of the minds and hearts of little children and adults. Make, make no mistake about it, that individual, that group is at war with God. And that's why God will be fully justified and righteous when all these people and groups throughout human history stand before him. Think about this. This is why there's such a battle over the book of Revelation. Do you know what you want to know why there's the most intense battle over the book of Revelation more than any other book in the Bible? The bi- the spiritual warfare that rages around the teaching of the book of Revelation and the fact that the spiritual warfare that rages around the book of Revelation is primarily concentrated within what is called the Christian church or the evangelical Christian church, Christendom is the epicenter of the great war between the devil and God in silencing the the most important book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And why is there such a warfare around the teaching of the book of Revelation? Why is the book of Revelation so controversial? Why is it that so many denominations and churches and pastors refuse to teach the book of Revelation, but they'll teach other books? Why? Why? Because the book of Revelation is the book in the Bible that sums up the continuity of all God's thought, all God's teaching. A beginning in Genesis where it declares that God, the Creator, capital C, created men and women in his own image. The saga of the children of Israel, the church, Jesus Christ, and all the stories of the patriarchs and the historical record of both Judaism and Christianity, but it is summed up in its totality. The final act of the play, so to speak, the the final scene of, of, of the great movie, except it's not a movie, it's not a play, it's final reality. It's all summed up in the book of Revelation. It's, it's, it, there is a climatic moment when God's primary adversary, Lucifer, the devil, Satan, is defeated by Jesus Christ at his second coming. When Jesus Christ returns to earth along with the armies of heaven and descends upon the valley of Megiddo outside of Jerusalem, Jesus Christ and the angelic armies of the Lord God Almighty, the men and women who have chosen to faithfully follow Jesus Christ, the the angels that follow God, they, they... engage in a spiritual as well as a physical military conflict with Lucifer, the fallen angels of various rankings, all the men and women who have pledged and made a covenant with the devil throughout the the, the centuries, the, the people who have accepted the mark of the beast by rejecting Jesus and, and professing that The Antichrist is God. They are all defeated at Armageddon. And then they will stand before the only courtroom in all existence that triumphs over every other courtroom and law built in any nation, whether it's America or ancient Greece or Rome or whatever. And all those people that have chosen to rebel against a God they say does not exist, will stand in the throne room of God at the great white throne of judgment. They will stand before the very God that they claim does not exist. And the Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is is Lord. There won't be any attempts to insult God. There will be a trembling of all those who wait to meet the judge of the universe. And the judgment, they will be judged for their actions, 
for their hideous deeds, for their rebellion, for their denial of the truth. And ultimately, they will be judged on the basis of whether or not they accepted God's free pardon of their sins through salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. And if they chose to reject God's free offer of salvation in Jesus Christ, their name is not written in the book of life, and your name must be written in the book of life in order to get into heaven and receive a brand new glorified body. Instead, because they have chosen to rebel against the reality of God's existence and his laws, they will receive a sentence, a legal sentence from the judge of the universe, and that legal sentence is eternal life inside the confines of the lake of fire, the bottomless pit in a place called hell, with, with the, the doorways of hell, like a great prison is sealed, because hell is something akin to a cosmic prison. It's something akin to what we call in the United States uh, our supermax prisons. I write about supermax, supermax prisons and their uh, relationship to God's uh, hell, how there's a, uh, an interesting connection between the two in my book, Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. So all these people will be sent for all eternity into hell. God's supermax prison, embedded into a different dimension. And all those who are saved by faith, their names are written in the book of life. They will receive brand new glorified bodies, perfect age, perfect health, perfect looks, perfect everything. And they will enter into paradise, the kingdom of heaven. They will meet Jesus Christ. They will meet those that died in Christ from centuries past. There will there will come about a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. You read about the spectacular, majestic beauty of paradise in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation, it says that there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, and that the tears of anyone who sheds a tear, every, the tear of every eye will be wiped away because God. God has this incredible passion and love, and he will wipe away the tears of pain and suffering from the eyes of every single person who enters into heaven. No one will enter into heaven suffering PSTD and trauma and shock and loss and abuse and on and on and on. No one. No one. So just think about this for a moment. Let's just do the math. Let's pretend you're a communist dictator like some of the communist dictators in China. And you, you, you treated people. You used the power that you were allowed to have, <clears throat> brutal, absolute, dictatorial power, and you used your power to, attra- to oppress your fellow man and children with the most cruel, horrific, barbaric, sadistic, evil, wicked punishments imaginable. To think that you would allow people to to grow in prisons and and connected to tubes and stuff, and and, and they're growing and they're maturing in their biological age, but they're not separated from the tubes and the chains, etc., in these dark rooms. They're just being, they're like human beings being harvested so that The communist Chinese government can make a vast fortune selling all their various body parts, and they who knows how many they harvest. And and China is not alone in this. God knows, and only God knows, are there similar things secretly happening in deep underground bases and hidden places in the United States? Are there similar things happening in Russia? and many other nations, Cuba. I mean, we're talking about communist regimes, but do these secret organ harvesting type locations exist in so-called Western 
uh, nations or EU nations or the United States. Only God knows. I mean, God can see. He can tell. And, you know, God's just about had it. <clears throat> there is a, there's a time and a place where the human race steps over the line. God, the only thing holding God back, you say, why does God allow all this to happen? There's only one reason. God has to counterbalance in his heart and mind what he's going to do. He has to be just and he has to be loving. We know in John 3.16 that God said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God loves all men and women with an incredible passion and sent his son, his only son, to die on a cross to pay the penalty for their sins so that by faith they might inherit eternal life through the forgiveness of sins. And so it's God's desire that every person possible could enter the kingdom of heaven. But at the same time, God has to counterbalance that with the knowledge that he can only tolerate this ever-increasing evil and wickedness and cruelty and sadism and what could be called abominations. He can only tolerate it for so long, the human sex trafficking. But I'm not merely talking about human sex trafficking. I've spoken to activists and documentary filmmakers who were not specific, thank God, but they gave me enough information uh, about what happens in certain uh, areas of human sex trafficking regarding the films and the videos that are made that cater to, to I don't know what percentage of the sex trafficking market, but people pay for snuff films and worse. Worse than snuff films. People who get off on the most abominable <clears throat> destruction, uh, the unspeakable torture and unspeakable acts towards children, to little girls, little boys, men and women, for money. And that, <clears throat> when I was doing research for a report two or three years ago, I read that an instrumental part of the international sex trafficking criminal industry. These are the, the two biggest criminal, and I think the three biggest criminal industries in the world. These are the, these are the industries of mystery Babylon, the great harlot, would be human sex trafficking, um, the selling, buying and selling of biological, nuclear, and chemical weapons. Mass prostitution, where that would go with sex trafficking, and drug international drug dealing, and these these areas, and there are other areas. War is another area. The actual hiring of private armies, it's an abomination beyond all belief. So, at a certain point, just like the human race in the days of Noah, the human race stepped over the line. I don't know where the line is, neither do you. There's a certain place where God has drawn a line in his justice and judgment and says, if mankind crosses this line, then God's going to send his wrath and judgment upon the earth. Okay? That has happened in human history before. It happened in the flood of Noah. It wasn't just because the world was wicked and filled with violence, as some suggest. That was one of the primary reasons. But it was a lot deeper than that. And, and people don't want to, people um, construct false theological arguments in, in a vain attempt to destroy the truth of Scripture because, they, because, it, because the truth personally upsets them. So they don't rightly divide the word, not on the basis of rightly dividing the word. They, they bias and twist and modify the word of God because perhaps they personally uh, can't, come, can't come to grips with it. Well, the fact of the matter is that wickedness and violence dominated the earth, and that was one of the primary reasons that God sent 
the judgment of Noah and the great flood. But for crying out loud, read, read the scripture in relationship to the other scriptures. Rightly divide the word of God when you read the flood of Noah. And you'll see some interesting components that reveal very clearly the primary motive for the flood of Noah. Yes, the wickedness and violence of man was unprecedented. That was clearly a part of it. But I believe the trigger that caused God to send the flood was the fact that the human race not only did the abomination of violence and perversion, but the human race, when they began, when women, human women began mating with fallen angels, the Rephim, producing the Rephim, which produced the Nephilim, a hybrid race of human female DNA and fallen angel DNA, that this was the, the crossover line in God's judgment. And you say, you know, I hear these ridiculous counter arguments like the Sethite view, which falls apart. The Sethite view is an embarrassing rebuttal to Noah's flood. You see, what happened? Read, read the book of Genesis. God is all about being fruitful and multiplying. God even gives genetic laws of reproduction. God gives his plan of reproduction in being fruitful and multiply. And God specifically says, that this that any species that he creates is a cor- is supposed to reproduce after its kind which means within the same species trees are not supposed to give birth to babies but when the human race breaks that when you have human women with the human women dna mating with fallen angels those are two entirely different species and they're producing a sinful hybrid called the Nephilim, and God says that's it. And you know why God says this is? It's it. It's very simple. Because God's primary mandate is to be fruitful and multiply. Why? Because God loved the world so much, he wants to save as many people as possible. And if women are reproducing with fallen angels, that being, which is a hybrid between fallen angel DNA and human DNA, is no longer a man or a woman. It's not human. And something that is not human cannot be saved. So if the human race was to continue on exponentially with fallen angels mating with human women, and and let's say the majority of the population then eventually is Nephilim, they are no longer human. And being no longer human, they can no longer be saved. Because the, the only species, if you will, the only part of God's creation, according to God's word, that can be saved is a man or a woman. Men and women, human beings made in the image of God, are God's crowning creation. They are above every creation, including the angels. And as such, it's only human beings that can be saved. So when you destroy the possibility of human beings being uh, produced, you cut off the possibility of the Savior, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> coming into the earth through a specific genetic line, and you create a satanic genetic line. So, at that time in history, that was the reason God flooded the earth, killing all the different species, animals, birds, fish, whatever, that were left in the flood, except for the ones that were brought into the Ark of Noah. They uh, were allowed to reproduce and to be fruitful and multiply. Okay, also in the account of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah stepped over the line and uh, that caused the judgment of God to come down. But most people don't read the account of Sodom and Gomorrah accurately. They think it's, they they classify it as, oh, well, gee, homosexuality was the sin. This was the ultimate sin which caused God to uh, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Is that really true? Was Sodom and Gomorrah the only city and area 
in the history of mankind, which in where there was a pro- proliferation of of homosexual behavior or lesbian behavior, certainly not. Look at ancient uh, Greece, ancient Rome, many other cultures. Look at the United States of America. And then read the narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah and why God destroyed it. And if you read it, it's obvious that God did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of, quote, homosexuality. I know that's a rude awakening for a lot of Christians, but you need to read the text properly. God did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. What was the sin? Let's identify the sin that made mankind cross the line. When the, when, when, when the angels came down to visit Sodom, on God's behalf, to see whether it was worthy of judgment. Remember, these angels also visited Abraham. And when the angels came to Sodom, they slept in the open city square. They didn't, they didn't uh, sleep in the home with the locked door of Lot and his wife. Lot knew what happened after the sun went down in Sodom. So he encouraged and begged that the visitors that he knew were angels slept inside his house for their own safety. But it says the men of Sodom gathered together. But it says more than that. It says all the people of Sodom gathered together. That means the women, and I don't know to what young age, of boys and girls, but we know for sure the women and the men of Sodom, the the straight heterosexuals, they all gathered around to watch what these angels were going to do, excuse me, what the men of Sodom were going to do to the angels. Because they knew they were angels. They had experience with that in, in that culture. So the men of Sodom attempted to rape the visitors. The primary purpose of of the intended rape was not homosexual rape. Sorry to break it to you. The transgression was, it was the men of Sodom attempting to rape God's angels. Once again, it was the violation of two different species. So it was the human men of Sodom who violated the law of God in a way that constituted the the men of Sodom wanted to rape the, the angels that came down to visit and to rescue Lot and his family. This explains why. Why else would Lot he offers to this raving, apparently sex-starved mob of males. But remember, who's watching? Who's sitting all around this, the sex-craved mob? Who's watching? Women in large numbers. It says, and all the people of Sodom gathered around. So all the women, all the men, heterosexual, etc., gathered to watch this spectacle of the men of Sodom raping the angels. That was the primary sin. And so when the men of Sodom attempted it, the, the, the angels supernaturally blinded them. And even in their blindness, these men still attempted to rape the angels. Then the angels got Lot, the, the children and the wife, out of Sodom before God was going to judge it with fire and brimstone. And, we, and then the rest is history. Sodom was destroyed with fire and brimstone. And Lot's wife was warned not to turn around and look at Sodom with kind of a longing. So you see how we misconstrue the actual nature of the sin which brought about the judgment? So in the last days, you're going to see a bunch of cataclysmic judgments. God isn't going to just sleep through the atrocities that have been happening. We're, we're at the boiling point. 
And, and there's a dynamic tension between the love of God wanting to save as many people as possible, and then the holiness, the righteousness, the justice of God that demands that he judges this wickedness. And the proof of the wickedness is the human race will reject Jesus Christ as Lord and worship the Antichrist as God, a false God. So right now, where we are in history is God is God must act soon to send judgment on earth according to his own law, righteousness, and holiness. But at the same time, God is faced with this dynamic tension of wanting to save as many people as possible. So what is God is eager to do, what God is eager to send the power of his Holy Spirit to do, is to cause his church to truly be set on fire by the power of the Holy Spirit and go into all the world and preach the gospel. Here we are in a place where God is facing a dynamic tension. On one hand, he wants to save as many people as possible. On one hand, it is the desire of God that his church and individual Christians would be obedient and bring in the last day's soul harvest and that they would preach the gospel to every nation and to every person. That is the heartbeat of God. It's the heartbeat of God that this last day's soul harvest and the preaching of the gospel go forth like never before. Because God wants there to be one great last day soul harvest where millions and millions of people come into the kingdom of God before the tribulation period begins and the Antichrist rules and reigns and the, 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 the horrific judgments come down during the seven-year tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble. You see how these two events are racing towards one another? Right now, where we are in the world and in this nation, we are in, at least in the United States, we are in a time of relative prosperity and peace and safety because of the grace of God working in our political realm. But when that grace of God ceases to work within our political realm, and those that hate Christ and hate Christians come to power, you can, you can figure out what the results will be. Now, God has a prophetic destiny for America. God has a prophetic destiny for you. They're intertwined. Your prophetic destiny is released um, to the degree that you're hooked up with God's prophetic destiny. If you're going to live a life of selfishness and and myopic perception, you're not hooked up to God's prophetic destiny. But if 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 you have yielded by an act of your will to a burden, a supernatural burden of the Holy Spirit, where your heart is broken to see the lost saved and to bring into a last day's soul harvest, your heart is synced up with the heart of God. God, because he was involved at the very beginning of America with the Pilgrims and Puritans in the 1600s. God has a prophetic destiny to God, uh, for America to use America as the catalyst, as the platform of the mightiest last day's soul harvest in the history of the world, where America and the nations that America reaches brings in tens, if not hundreds of millions of people into the kingdom of God. Even where America is not evolved, God's not, uh, God's not restricted. That's why all these Iranian people are seeing prophetic dreams and receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior without any, quote, preacher preaching to them. So right now, we're, 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 we're at the place in time where there's two factors happening. We're moving to the place of judgment and cataclysm because God, out of his holiness, must deal with the evil that is rising. God can only take it so long. But at the same time, God has to, in a sense, battle within himself because it's God's desire that every man and woman and boy and child that that will come and be born again by faith will indeed do so. It's God's overwhelming desire and compassion because he's a God of love to win as many people as possible 
to Jesus Christ so that they can spend all eternity with him in heaven. That is something that is so important to God. That's why he says, be fruitful and multiply in in numerous places in the Old Testament, especially the book of Genesis. So we're in this exact time period. You and I were called before the foundation of the world to be here for such a time as this. God chose for you specifically to be in the time period that I just described. And as further evidence of that, God knew you before the foundation of the world. God knew you before you were created um, by your father and mother. God knew you. And since God knew that he would send you into a time zone where there's this great race and great battle between coming cataclysm, the tribulation period, the Antichrist, the outpouring of God's judgments, and at the same time, God's overwhelming desire based on love to bring as many people as possible into the kingdom of God to save as many people as possible. So because of that, the Holy Spirit, by the, by the millions and millions of people, there are millions and millions of Christians who are alive today, and there are millions and millions of Christians, should the Lord tarry, that are being born right now, or women who are pregnant right now, with people who are going to become Christians. And the one thing that all these Christians have in common, and I, this could encompass many generations, it could, it could easily encompass 50 years uh, of Christians being born alive in various ages and the ones that are being born now, or women that are pregnant, because we don't know the exact time that Christ is coming. Whatever the case, at the very least, right now on planet Earth, there is an unusual, an unusual type of Christian that has been placed on the Earth for such a time as this. And God knew that he was going to send these unusual Christians for this exact time period for the purposes that I've described. God has equipped these, this unique uh, generations of Christians. He's a, he equipped them very, very uniquely with exceptional supernatural talents, abilities, gifts, supernatural power, and wisdom. In other words, they have been fully downloaded for the assignment that I just described, in the most unusual way. Now, most of them don't realize that they have been supernaturally equipped already in the most unusual way. They're living life, if you will, sadly to say, on autopilot. They're they're living life uh, unaware of the fact that God has embedded in their inner being hundreds of icons that represent supernatural apps from God that will uniquely equip them to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus for the time period that we live in. So what has to happen in order for this last day's soul harvest to occur and these, this countless number of salvations that must occur before the judgment and, and, and the, the destruction comes? What has to occur? God has to ruffle the feathers of people on planet Earth. He has to shake things up so people will be uh, at least open to his message. But God, through, through the power of his Holy Spirit, and God speaking to his church through anointed preachers, Bible teachers, pastors, people with prophetic giftings, God has numerous generations and tribes, if you will, of men and women who, who have an, an amazing capacity to open up the gifts, the talents, and abilities that God's people have. And we are right on the precipice of a great revival. And when the, this great revival is ignited, and the Spirit of God, in the last days I will pour out my Spirit in all flesh, the Bible says, when God pours out his last day's outpouring, all of a sudden there are going to be millions of people. Many of you will be among those people who all of a sudden begin to realize, 
dear God, I have all these gifts and talents and abilities from God that I never knew that I had, but but they're going to spring up suddenly and you're going to go into action very quickly. And you're going to be stunned because you didn't know that all this time this was embedded in you. You you were just, in a sense, waiting for the timer to go off for them to be activated. And so there will be a great outpouring of God's Spirit. This breed of teachers and pastors and leaders will equip God's people, and there will be a, a generation of true believers on the earth ignited by the powers of revival that have been especially equipped to bring in the last day's soul harvest, to bring in millions and millions into the kingdom of God in fulfillment of what Jesus Christ said uh, regarding a final harvest for the for the the fields are white with harvest for harvest and the laborers are few, but the Spirit of God will birth the proper amount of laborers and there'll be a massive last day soul harvest. Let me read you a verse from the Bible. Jesus Christ <clears throat> says in the book of Acts, chapter 1, um, starting at verse um, 9. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. See, that's a warning not to, that's a warning that no Bible teacher, no Christian leader, no no Christian should ever, ever, ever predict the time and the hour or the day of the Lord's return. So when you hear a man, a minister or whatever, say, write in a book or make a statement that he knows the time of the the Lord's return, you know that he's in total error. You should reject it. Because Christ just said, no man knows the time or the hour. And then Christ says, but you shall receive power When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And and, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a closed and a cloud, excuse me, and a cloud took him out of their sight, and while they were Gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, angels, obviously, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven, into the heavens? Then Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into the heavens. So you see, we're not supposed to be obsessed about the time and the hour and the calendar day of the Lord's return according to Jesus. Instead, we should recognize that when we receive power, okay, when we receive power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, the fact that we're receiving the power of the Holy Spirit for the express purposes of being evangelists and witnesses to all these cities and to the ends of the earth, it is that endowment from power on high for the purpose of evangelism, which is the sign. It's a prophetic super sign that the Lord, that the Lord's coming is near. Get your eyes on God's priority, which is the power of God to fill you, and quit getting out the calendars and, and making mistakes and, and embarrassing the kingdom of God by projecting falsely the time of the the Lord's return. And so in Acts chapter 2, it says, this is on the day of Pentecost, when the church and the disciples were gathered together as one, praying. And then the Holy Spirit comes down 
And, 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 and Peter says, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel from Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 16. And then starting at verse 17, it says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and on my female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire, and the vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're, we're in the last days. The Holy Spirit is being poured out on all flesh. That is God's prophetic super sign that the Lord is going to return. Don't worry about your calendar. Concern yourself with obeying God and being clothed with power from on high and being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's your concern. It says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. God's doing that now. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. We need to see more of that. The the Spirit of God being poured out on our sons and daughters. Oh, don't worry. Uh, that they've walked away from Christ temporarily. That's a temporary thing. They can't escape God. And they will be brought to God, just like I was brought to God, and many of you were brought to God in rebellion during the Jesus movement. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. We need to expect that. Your old men shall dream dreams. Okay, I'm talking about prophetic dreams, not foolhardy dreams. And even on my male servants and my female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. So, yes, we as believers should, should prophesy. That's why I, when I label myself in my ministry, I don't quote, call myself a prophet, but I, but I say uh, that I have prophetic gifts, that I'm prophesying. There's a difference. I just don't want it to be coronated as some kind of king. Um, and, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and, and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Because, because this is what's going to happen, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's going to be, we are at the precipice of a, of a great last day soul harvest. If the church in America will respond to God and cry out to God, if you as an individual will respond to God and cry out to God, if I will do the same thing, God will answer and you will, and I will, and our nation will, or any nation that chooses to do that, wherever you live in the world, then your prophetic destiny will be realized. Man, if that doesn't, if the, if the knowledge of that doesn't cause your bones to burn and the fire of the Holy Spirit into you to quicken and be on fire, I don't know what else would. This is why at this time it is absolutely critical that those of you that God, the Holy Spirit of God is calling you to be a partner with this ministry. And many of you have obeyed, and I thank God for every one of you. The Holy Spirit of God is calling you to be a partner of, of this ministry. So that means you need to say to the Lord, what do you want me to do? You can start by being a prayer warrior, an intercessory prayer warrior, who prays for me, the ministry, and my family and wages spiritual warfare on our behalf so we can win souls for Christ. Thank God for all of you faithful ones that have obeyed. And then, thank God for those of you that obey and send out the links of these programs, video and audio, far and wide, to do an end run around censorship, because souls are saved through these messages, and revival is spread through these messages. And then finally, 
Ask the Lord. I mean, I'm talking about to do business with God. He says, do kingdom business until I come. Do business with God. So you go to God and say, I believe that what Paul is reading from the word is true. And you simply ask God, Lord, what would you have me do? How would you have me financially contribute or financially donate to Paul McGuire Ministries? Paradise Mountain Church. And then whatever God puts on your heart, you obey him and you pray for us. And God may speak to you in in an amazing way and in ways we've had people give in ways they've never thought they would and give in large amounts like they never thought they would. The point is they obeyed the Lord. We've had people who have been faithful with, with what we would call medium amounts but they've been faithful to the Lord's call and command uh, on them to donate those medium amounts. And we have large numbers of people who are faithful, they go to, but they go to the Lord, and the Lord says, give a certain amount. And they are faithful to give every month that amount, whether it's $15 or $25 or $50 or $100. They're faithful, you see. And when, every, when God's people all together come together and give and pray, it adds up to a lot. A lot of people being faithful with, I don't even like to use the word smaller gift. Every gift is precious to God. So when lots of people are obeying God consistently with regular gifts, it all adds up. In the same way, when those people, God is blessed with unusual finances, or unusual blessings, and then they give out of their abundance and prosperity or expected prosperity. They help us go out into all the world. And those who are faithful, what we call with the medium amounts, it's faithfulness according to what God has done for you. And most importantly, it's faithfulness based on what God is speaking into your heart to give. So. I want to personally thank every one of you, Um, because without you, from prayers and distributing the links, we couldn't do what we're doing. So it's, you know, I feel such an acute sense of responsibility. Visit paulmcguire.us, that's paulmcguire.us. Spread our radio program, our video messages, our Roku channel far and wide. Come visit me at the Paradise Mountain Church services, which are held um, on a regular basis right here in Studio City. And, 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 and you know, when you look it up on your, uh, um, whatever you call it, whatever electronic device you're trying to come to the meeting, don't go to the mailing uh, address. You know, like most churches, we have a public mailing address because people correspond to us from all over the world. Well, if you drive to the public mailing address, that's a P.O. box. (laughs) I hate to tell you, (laughs) I don't hold church services at the post office box. But we do hold regular monthly services we have for a decade, 15 years or more. We do hold regular. Paradise Mountain Church Services at a regular hotel meeting room, like many churches in Southern California do. And you'll see me there. And I I deliberately post the name of the hotel with all the directions and maps you need at paulmcguire.us. So we have been meeting for quite a while now at the Sportsman's Lodge in Studio City, centrally located. So that's where you want to drive to. And, and I'll talk to you personally. I pray for people peace personally. I counsel people personally uh, and uh, perform certain sacraments with people personally. Um, and it's my joy. It's my privilege. I'm a servant. I, I, don't, I don't stand before the people expecting to be served. My attitude is I'm there to serve. And those of, the, you, that, that, those of you that have known me, I've been there till 3.30 in the morning counseling people praying for people. People are saved. People are being delivered. The gifts of the Spirit are in operation. People are being healed psychologically in other ways. Miracles are happening. 
but you won't see any sensationalism on my part. I don't I don't believe that God needs help with human manipulation. Everything is done decently in order, so you'll feel comfortable. There's no showmanship and all the rest of that. But I believe, you know, the Bible says, don't forsake uh, the assembling of yourselves together. You need some place to go and be covered for. You need to go somewhere, some place where a pastor like me, I'm, I'm a registered pastor. I'm a registered, licensed pastor, have been for decades. I'm also, a, a, a have a teach as a doctor of theology and eschatology uh, given to me by one of the most prestigious uh, universities, Christian universities and seminaries in the United States. So I'm fully trained theologically, fully licensed. I've been doing this a long time. And when I come and minister at Paradise Mountain Church, and by the way, you need to go to the paulmcguire.us website, go to the Roku channel. We have hundreds of hours of the messages I've given at Paradise Mountain Church. That's why I laugh when we get attacked. And they said, oh, you know, Paul McGuire doesn't preach at his church. Oh, really? Well, where did those hundreds of hours of two and a half hour, three hour intensive messages that I'm giving at Paradise Church come from if I don't preach at Paradise Mountain Church going back like 10 years? Somebody's lying, and it's not all the people that come there and get prayed for there. It's people who, who take pot shots at our ministry that live you know, on the East Coast and other places who, who um, don't like uh, Christians. Um, when you come to Paradise Mountain Church, we have people regularly jump on planes and fly from all over the country and all over the world to, become, to be a part of our meetings. Okay, and and the reason they come is the Holy Spirit calls them, and at every meeting I will pray over anybody. I pray over everybody generally, but I will pray for you individually. That's my delight, because I'm a servant. I don't I don't come to be served, and as I pray, the Lord moves and people are healed and lives are changed, and that's that's man. That's the joy. You know how I get the joy of the Lord in my life? By doing what God called me to do. I don't always feel like doing what I'm doing, but when I get into it, I feel the joy of the Lord. So when I pray for people, like I pray for this, um, and I'm very protective of people's identities. I don't ask people to give their identity, and I don't mention their names on the radio. But a woman suffered a, a, a very serious traumatic uh, tragedy, and she was suffering because of it, okay? And uh, I laid hands on her head, forehead. Her husband was standing right next to her, which is what I like. I don't, I, I avoid any appearance of impropriety. And I put my hand on her forehead gently, and I don't push people and stuff like that. And as I'm praying for her, I'm listening to the Lord. And the power of the Lord um, is moving I can feel the power of the Lord moving. It's, it seems like it moves from my heart, through my arm, through my hands. And the Spirit of God, it feels like a, the Spirit of God is pouring into her, into her being, through her head. And I just feel her, her being, being filled with the power and the presence and the healing power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm simply praying for her. And I'm not saying anything yet, but besides just worshiping the Lord with her and her husband. Because I, God doesn't need me to blab over people. God doesn't need me to help him. I'm waiting on the Lord to, to see what instructions the Lord is giving me. And as the power of God is flowing into this, this, this woman with her husband standing there, as the power of God is flowing into her, as I'm laying hands on her, she begins to sob and convulse. When I say convulse, I'm not talking about some fireworks. I'm simply talking about it's like an inner shaking, not inappropriate behavior. Just nobody would probably notice, but I could feel it. The inner shaking and the inner tremble. I could feel her body trembling. And the reason it was trembling and the, realize, uh, the reason it was shaking, nobody observing it would have noticed this, okay? Because things are done decently in order. But I can sense it. And I know that the reason there's a trembling going on 
and, and kind of a shaking in her inner being is because the Spirit of God is pouring into her and it's coming against the strongholds that have been erected through the tragedy that she experienced and that she has not yet fully been healed from. And I can feel the Spirit of God moving uh, and, and pressing against those strongholds, and that's why there's the trembling. So all I do is keep praising and worshiping the Lord, and then I take authority over the strongholds, and then the Spirit of God gently and lovingly dissolves those strongholds, and there's an infusion of the Holy Spirit into the depths of her personality, into the depths of her body, soul, and spirit and mind. And the Spirit of God goes into her and start to, starts to cleanse her and sanctify her and to set her free. And to make a long story short, tears are pouring out of her eyes, and you can feel like there's like a thousand-pound weight supernaturally being lifted off of her. And then her, pres- her husband had a prayer request, and I put my hand on his head, and I prayed for him. And I, I do that sometimes, well, as long as, as, you know, you know, as long as people need me, I try to make myself available. And, and I, we, we start the meetings earlier at 6, uh, and I'm trying to, to uh, end the meetings on a much prompter schedule. But I'm not one of these pastors who makes a sermon and bolts out the door. I'll stay there, and to the best of my ability that I can, I'll talk with people. I'll listen to them. I try to know people personally by name. Uh, I recognize you when you come in. I'll say goodbye to you. In other words, it's personal. It's personal. It's not, we're not running a McDonald's franchise. You're not lined up to get your happy meal at the window. It's personal. That's the way Christianity should be. And even though I'm well known uh, in certain quarters across the United States and around the world, you know, I don't have any attitude uh, because I see myself as a servant, period. And the day I stop seeing myself as as a servant is the day I guarantee you that the Spirit of the Lord and the Holy Spirit that enables me to minister is the day the Holy Spirit will depart my ministry. The minute Paul McGuire starts to cultivate any little attitude in his heart that he's anything more than a servant of Jesus is the day the Spirit of the Lord will begin to depart from my ministry. And I fear that. But I don't want it to be all sober. Uh, The joy of the Lord is our strength. We laugh a lot. I'm not doom and gloom. I'm not scary. I can be heavy, but we laugh a lot. And just being in in the presence of the Lord, the joy of the Lord will heal you. So I invite you to come. We have a meeting coming up in February, which is, we're in February already. The exact date, as usual, is going to be posted at paulmcguire.us, paulmcguire.us. Quit sitting on the couch, spacing out, and quit depriving yourself of the blessing of God. Come out, and and I promise you, you'll be blessed. And uh, you get map directions, and you really should register by going to paulmcguire.us. Everything's free. Parking's free. The meeting's free. And I'd love to see you. And if you have a prayer need, then just tell me. Or if you just want to be anonymous and sit in the back, that's fine, too. Because this is not about, you know, this is about being loving and making people comfortable and giving people their space. God bless you. This is your brother in Christ. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Oh, I forgot. I'm speaking at the Hear the Watchman Super Bible Prophecy Conference coming up in Dallas, Texas. I believe the starting date of the conference is March 5th. It's coming up soon. There's a lot of great speakers. Uh, Mike and Jeannie Kerr are hosting and producing the conference. You can get information by going to the paulmcguire.us website. Hey, join with thousands of other believers in Christ, like-minded believers, and come out to the Dallas, Texas, here the Watchman Conference. The last time I spoke there, the power of God came down so strong, and, and the power of God was moving through other speakers. It's a great time in the Lord, so make sure you come out. God bless you. This is your brother in Christ. If you have a prayer request, contact me and say you have a prayer request and be brief uh, and we'll pray over it. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire.